So we will, where are we at? We're two minutes from the, the top of the hour and we'll, we'll launch, we'll launch right at 12 and get started. Looks like we've got 13. I just hope I don't have a lot of fire trucks outside racing up and down the street. <laughs> you know they will. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I asked I asked the dog to please be quiet for an hour, but she'll probably come charging in. <laughs> oh, thank you. Fortunately, I don't have any. Fortunately, my children are not not here because that would have been our our interruption. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Okay, so I think we've got, we'll get started here in a minute. Okay. So DJ, are we we ready to to go? Um, yes. Okay. Great. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Jeff Gould, and I'm here with my my co-pilot and co-host Peter Lawson, and our uh, wonderful guest today, Kevin Shepard, to discuss the Corporate Transparency Act: What Real Estate Owners Should Know About Compliance. And uh, a couple of housekeeping items to get started here on disclaimers. So just a, a couple of disclaimers here, you know, as it relates to the document and to the presentation, uh, it's published by the law firm of Venable LLP. It is not intended to provide legal advice or opinion. Such advice may only be given when related to specific fact situations that Venable has accepted an engagement as counsel to address. And subsequently, uh, it is also being co-hosted by CCIM Los Angeles. And this is really for information purposes only. All attendees and readers are advised to consult with their legal counsels and other professional advisors regarding any legal compliance or other matters related to the content presented. The presenter and the author of the document do not assume any responsibility or liability for any actions taken based on the information provided herein. This is the public service announcement. So uh, take note of the disclaimers. I've wanted to do that for a while as uh, you give a public service announcement. So that felt good. Uh, on to the next slide. We'll thank our fiduciary committee sponsors here. EXP Commercial, Lineage Asset Advisors. On the silver side, Clumex Stern, wonderful CPA firm. Crost, another wonderful CPA firm. Northern Trust. Uh, bank and Wealth Manager, and Truist Wealth. So thank you to our committee sponsors. Next slide, please. Okay, so today we are talking about the wonderful world of the Corporate Transparency Act. And again, we have a wonderful thought leader on this, uh, this topic. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna give an introduction to the CCIM Institute first. Uh, there are a number of attendees who may not be familiar with the CCIM Institute, so we want to give a little plug and commercial. Then I'm going to kick it over to my co-host, Peter Lawson, to talk a little bit about our CCIM Los Angeles uh, chapter and the fiduciary committee that we run. Then we'll kick it over to Kevin to talk about the Corporate Transparency Act, and we will discuss and have an opportunity for audience questions and answers. A little housekeeping on questions and answers. You will have an opportunity in the box at the bottom of the screen, I believe, for everybody to type in your Q&A. You can type in the Q&A during the presentation, and we'll go ahead and filter and, and answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Another thing, this presentation is being recorded, so if you want to come back and uh, reference it, you are free to do so, and we'll be sending a follow-up link after the presentation. So. As a next step, we'll move on here. For those of you that are not familiar with CCIM, it stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. And for over 50 years, the designation has and remains to be the gold standard for commercial real estate professionals. Uh, uh, everyone from appraisers, asset managers, brokers, developers, investors, lenders, and other allied professionals. 
And as CCIM designees, we have to complete a rigorous program of advanced coursework on everything from investment, real estate, financial analysis, market analysis, and also dem demonstrate extensive experience with our portfolio of commercial real estate transactions and um, otherwise. So it is, again, the gold standard in, in commercial real estate designations. And I would highly encourage those of you that are not familiar to, with CCIM and want to get a deeper dive in education to either contact us or look at the CCIM.com website. Next slide, please. The Institute, uh, again, you know, part of what we're aiming to do is be a thought leader on topics related to fiduciaries and real estates here locally and more, more, more broadly. But the courses are taught by instructors. These are instructors who are seasoned professional, professionals and industry leaders in commercial real estate investment methodologies and tools. We provide tools that speed the pathway between opportunity, strategic decision-making for real estate and success uh, in the real estate investment sphere. So we do have our core curriculum, but we also have award courses, which we'll talk a little bit about, and Peter will talk a little bit about, which provide additional education on top of our core curriculum. And I believe this might be outdated, but CCIM uh, designees and members uh, include uh, about 8,000 professionals across the board here nationally and internationally. So I believe that's growing and we're getting a lot more uptake and a lot more designees here locally and, and broadly. Who we serve, as I talked about and alluded to a little bit earlier, it's everything from investors and investment counselors all the way down to bankers, attorneys, portfolio managers, commercial lenders, brokers, developers. So we have a broad array of those in the commercial real estate industry that we serve and you know, that the Institute serves. And you know what we're trying to do at the fiduciary committee is expand the curriculum to others in the industry, fiduciaries that are managing real estate portfolios, asset managers within banks and otherwise. So I would encourage those of you, again, that are within these related fields to, uh, to look and see how the CCIM designation can benefit you. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to my co-host, Peter Lawson, to talk a little bit about our CCIM Los Angeles Fiduciary Committee. So Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Greetings to everybody. And as Jeff had alluded to in the last slide, part of the CCIM Institute is to expand uh, its, its network and help various individuals uh, in the real estate and related fields. Hence the CCIM LA Fiduciary Committee was formed a few years ago uh, to provide education, network, and guidance to the complex topics and elements of real estate wealth transfer. In many cases, this includes existing trusts or high net worth or ultra high net worth individuals and family offices of which a fiduciary is going to have a role not only in the acquisition and disposition of real estate, but in the management. Hence, this committee is currently made of best in class corporate fiduciaries, private individuals who act as fiduciaries, family offices, and various real estate advisors and related fields, including estate planning attorneys, CPAs, wealth advisors, and a number of banks. The Fiduciary Committee offers fiduciary-related educational webinars, such as what we are going to be uh, having today, networking opportunities for those who may be looking for other resources within that unique but very broad field of the fiduciary world, uh, CCIM education, uh, this is for acquiring knowledge by those in fiduciary to understand what the CCIM curriculum can bring to add value to their work. And conversely, on the reverse, uh, CCIM's understanding better the unique elements of what it is to be a fiduciary. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor or getting involved in our committee, then the following slide uh, will give you an opportunity to check out on that. As I said, one of the upcoming courses will be on May 30th. This is a ward class. And if you're interested, please look at the link or consider registering. This is going to be a very fundamental, basic introduction into what is a fiduciary and how real estate professionals, whether they are going to represent a fiduciary client or sit across the table from a fiduciary uh, entity, has a better understanding of what their goals, their growth, income, diversity, and stability, and how all that is going to work in what that real estate professional 
CCIM would need to understand to have a successful transaction. And in some cases, we'll develop successful business relationships. So please consider learning more about uh, our committee uh, and our courses. As I mentioned, here are some of our current members. Please note, Carmela Ma uh, is the founder and I'm a co-founder of the fiduciary courses. Uh, without her, we wouldn't be here today. So we wanna give a nod to her and her tremendous contribution to what she has given us and an opportunity to get this started. I was the lucky one she chose to co-found and co-write the course. And as you can see, we have Jeff, uh, my uh, partner in crime in current uh, offerings and very distinguished representatives from the title world, the public title, other CCIMs, uh, foreclosure and high net worth managers, and several senior uh, individuals from trust companies, including but not limited to Northern Trust and Whittier Trust. So as I said, if you are interested in getting involved with the committee, here's some of the contact information. Don't be shy, we welcome everyone and what knowledge and opportunities you can bring to us to help us do a better job in giving that education or knowledge uh, to uh, CCIMs uh, and people in the fiduciary world. We'll go on to the next slide. And now I have the distinct pleasure of giving you a brief introduction to our guest. Kevin L. Shepard is a part partner in the real estate practice group and chair of the finance committee and a managing director for finance at Federal LLP in Baltimore. He is one of the country's leading authorities on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing issues as they affect the US legal profession. And he's written extensively on these issues and has even testified before the US Senate and proposed various beneficial ownership legislation. He's an immediate past ABA treasurer and he's a former chair of the ABA Task Force on Gatekeeping Regulation and Profession. Kevin is currently serving a three-year term at the ABA's representative to the U.S. Treasury and Paris-based Financial Action Task Force. Kevin is a former chair of the ABA section of real property, trust and estate law, and a past president of the American College of Real Estate Lawyers. Without saying any further, we have one of the most distinguished and knowledgeable individuals on this topic, and it's my pleasure now to introduce to you, Kevin L. Shepard. Thank you very much, Peter and Jeff. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, I'm going to go over the Corporate Transparency Act, the CTA, as it's referred to. Uh, we're now four and a half months into the live portion of the CTA. And I will provide a, a brief overview of the CTA and then discuss some of the uh, issues, uh, challenges that we're facing as we try to comply with the CTA. Um, give you a brief overview of what this uh, presentation will include. I'll discuss very briefly, what is a reporting company becoming two flavors, domestic and foreign? Who's the beneficial owner? And more importantly, who is exempted from the definition of beneficial owner? Who's a company applicant? And how many company applicants can there be? Will you be a company applicant? What information must be provided? Uh, and who's it provided to? And how often must you update the beneficial ownership information, what we refer to as the BOI? Uh, is it on a monthly basis, annual basis? What's the updating obligation? What are the compliance deadlines? Uh, what are they for 2024? What are they uh, after 2024? You may have heard the phrase FinCEN identifier. FinCEN stands for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. That's a bureau of the U.S. Treasury, and it's uh, the acronym is FinCEN. And there's a FinCEN identifier concept that uh, tags along with the CTA. Should you get a FinCEN identifier? And as I mentioned from the outset, what lessons have we learned during the first four months of the CTA's rollout? Under the CTA, FinCEN is charged with issuing three sets of implementing regulations. Just think of these as three buckets of regulations. The first bucket and the one that we'll be focused on and the one that you should be most interested in are the reporting regulations. Those were finalized on September 30th, 2022. Uh, more recently, as of last December, on December 21st, the access regulations were issued by FinCEN. 
who has access to this information that's going into a huge database? Can anyone access it? Uh, so we'll talk about that. Then the third bucket of regulations that will be issued, they have not been issued yet, deal with the proposed customer due diligence, what is referred to as CDD regulations. And we anticipate uh, FinCEN issuing those by later this year or in early 2025. Let's talk about a reporting company. As I mentioned, they come in two types, a domestic reporting company and a foreign reporting company. In a domestic reporting company, it's any entity that is a corporation, a limited liability company or LLC, and this is important, or any other entity that is created by the filing of a document with the Secretary of State or similar office. So if you have a general partnership, that's created not by a filing, that's just a contractual agreement between the parties. That is not a domestic reporting company. Uh, and most trusts are not uh, created by the filing of a document. So they are also not a domestic reporting company. Let's talk about a foreign reporting company. And again, that's any entity that's a corporation, an LLC or other entity. It's formed in the laws of a foreign country, a non-US uh, jurisdiction, and it's registered to do business in any state or tribal jurisdiction by a filing of a document with the state secretary of state. So some foreign corporations do business in states without registering. Those would not be a foreign reporting company. But at the moment, the, the first filing, when they register to do business in a state, that transforms them into a foreign reporting company under the CTA. Let's talk about who is a beneficial owner under the CTA. And each reporting company has a beneficial owner. And that means any individual the key word there is individual. The whole purpose of the CTA is to give law enforcement access uh, to individuals. Law enforcement got frustrated by uh, running into an LLC. Then the member of that LLC was another LLC. And then th that LLC had another LLC as a member. And you never could get to a warm breathing person. The CTA seeks to cut through all that and get to a, a warm breathing individual. So the beneficial owner means any individual who directly or indirectly either exercises substantial control over the reporting company or owns or controls at least 25% of the ownership interests of that reporting company. The regulations define substantial control uh, extraordinarily broadly. Uh, substantial control means you're a senior officer, think a CFO, CEO, COO, a general counsel, uh, you have the authority to appoint or remove uh, senior officers or a majority of the, uh, of the board of directors or similar body. Uh, you have substantial influence over important decisions, be they business, finance, or structure of the entity. Then there's a catch-all, and the catch-all says you exercise substantial control if you exercise substantial control. I have no idea what that means, but all I know is it's very, very broad. And the same concept applies to the ownership interests. Um, that's defined very broadly under the CTA as well, and it seeks to capture uh, any form or any indicia of ownership of any reporting company. Um, and keep in mind that the uh, statute and the regulations use the disjunctive or the definition, so it imposes a control or economic interest test. There is no numerical limit on the number of beneficial owners a, a reporting company can have. Uh, some people said, why can't you just limit it to one or two people? It's easier that way. Uh, Treasury and Congress said, no, uh, we want to make it as expansive as possible. Uh, so the regulations have no numerical limit on beneficial owners. Well, how do you go about determining who's a beneficial owner? Uh, FinCEN has helpfully uh, proposed or identified a three-step process. First, you identify those individuals, again, individuals, who exercise substantial control over the company. Again, a very broad test for that. And once you've done that, you identify the types of ownership interests in the company and the individuals who own those, hold those ownership interests. Um, and in some cases on multi-tiered entities in particular, you need to calculate the percentage of ownership interests held directly or indirectly by the individuals to find out those who own or control directly or indirectly at least 25% of the ownership interests of the company. And that can get pretty complicated when you have a multi-tiered entity 
Uh, and there are some examples given by Fenson on how to go about doing that. Well, who's a company applicant? You may have heard that phrase. Uh, company applicants apply only to those reporting companies created on or after January 1, 2024. There's no looking back on uh, historical company applicants for pre-2024 reporting companies. And for a domestic reporting company, it's the individual, again, individual, who directly files the document that creates a domestic reporting company. So that's referred to as a direct filer. Same thing for a foreign reporting, uh, foreign reporting company. It's the individual who directly files a document that first registers that foreign reporting company with the state secretary of state. Then if there's, for both of them, it's the individual who is primarily responsible for directing or controlling the filing if more than one individual is involved in the filing of the document. What does that mean? That means there's a direct filer. That's the person who physically uh, delivers the formation or creation document to the state secretary of state. That person's a company applicant. If there's someone else involved in that process, the person who's primarily responsible for directing or controlling that filing, that's a second company applicant. There will never be more than two company applicants per reporting company by statute. Uh, on previous iterations of the regulations, uh, there was no limit on it. The FinCEN agreed that they uh, two is enough in this situation. Again, it's forward looking. It only applies to those reporting companies first filed or registered on or after January 1, 2024. <clears throat> now, once you're a company applicant, you're, you're a company applicant for life for that reporting company. That never changes. You can't remove your name as a company applicant uh, from that reporting company. Uh, so you're stuck with it. It's cast in stone. Um, reporting companies don't need to update the company applicant information. Unlike for beneficial ownership, that needs to be updated. Uh, the information for company applicants does not have to be updated. Um, and as I noted, the company applicant can't be removed from a beneficial ownership information report, even if that company applicant no longer has a relationship with a re reporting company. Uh, that person's moved on. You're still a company applicant for that company. Well, let's talk about what's included in the initial report filed with FinCEN. And there are three uh, categories or three uh, uh, categories of information. One is information about the reporting company itself. Every individual who is a beneficial owner of that reporting company, you need to provide information on that individual. And for entities, reporting companies formed after January 1, 2024, every individual who is a company applicant. <clears throat> and that's when you file your BOI report with FinCEN. Well, what's included in the initial report for the reporting company? Well, you need the full legal name of the reporting company. And if there's a trade name or doing business doing business as name, you need to reflect that as well in the report. The street address of the principal place of business, they don't want a PO box, has to be a physical street address. Then you have to indicate the state or tribal jurisdiction uh, where the entity was formed. Um, so that should be pretty easy to do. Then you have to provide the IRS taxpayer identification number of the, uh, the reporting company. So you'll need to get that piece of information before you file your file your beneficial ownership information report with FinCEN. Now, what about the initial report for the beneficial owner and the company applicant? What needs to be included there? You must identify each beneficial owner. Again, there's no numerical limit on that. And you have to identify each company applicant for that reporting company. And you provide the full name, legal name, and birth date of the individual, the complete current address, and case of a company applicant, who files formation documents as they as a course of business, uh, you just provide the business street address of that business. And on, in all other cases, you provide the residential street address for that individual. And that's the address used for tax residency purposes. And what's interesting about the first bullet point about the company applicant who forms uh, these entities as part of the individual's business, you just provide the business street address. That's fine. But you'll find out on the next slide that you also have to provide a copy of your driver's license, and that has your residential address. So FinCEN is getting both in that situation, uh, which is curious. You also have to provide a copy uh, from one of the following documents, a non-expired U.S. passport. And keep in mind that the passport number changes when the passport is renewed. 
And when that happens, you have to update FinCEN uh, that you have a new passport number. Or you can provide your non-expired ID document issued by a state, local government, or Indian tribe. Or most likely, you'll provide a non-expired driver's license issued by a state. Uh, driver's license numbers generally, I can't say this categorically, but generally, they don't change when renewed. And that uh, does not trigger a, a beneficial ownership information report update. Your picture may be updated, but that's not the key. It's, it's focusing on the, on the number. Uh, that's If that changes, you have to provide notice to FinCEN. And if you don't have any of those documents above, uh, you can provide a non-expired passport issued by a foreign government. The providing the, uh, the passport, the driver's license means you're providing a, an image from that document of your photograph. Nowhere does the CTA mention or direct a collection of images in this process. And that's been uh, a point of uh, criticism uh, for FinCEN because FinCEN is now collecting images and that may present privacy and security concerns, data breaches, hacking, malware attacks, et cetera, both within that federal database and also the reporting company. The reporting company is collecting this information uh, including uh, your driver's license or passport and storing it somewhere. Um, so that presents uh, some, some issues with security, privacy. Let me just summarize the compliance deadlines because um, they differ based on when the entity was created. For entities created before uh, or registered before January 1, 2024, you have a full year until January 1, 2025 to make your initial beneficial ownership information report. And I suspect that's what's happening now is that most pre-2024 entities are waiting later this year to file their initial BOI reports. Because if you file one now for a pre-2024 entity, if there are any changes between now and year end, you need to file an update with FinCEN within 30 days. And who needs uh, that extra paperwork uh, and burden? So I think a lot of people are waiting until later this year to make the initial filings for pre-2024 created or registered entities. Um, for previously exempt entities that are no longer exempt, you have 30 days to notify FinCEN. Same thing for updating uh, if a beneficial ownership information report that's been on, uh, with FinCEN. You have 30 days to do that. If there's an erroneous information, you have uh, 30 days to correct it with a database. And for entities created or registered during 2024, you have 90 days uh, after the creation. And for those created or registered on or after January 1, 2025, it goes back to the 30-day sequence uh, time period. So it's pretty much a 30-day updating, correcting uh, regime, except for this year uh, for entities created in 2024, where you have 90 days. Let's talk about the FinCEN identifier. And there may be some sensitivity in, in individuals providing their personally identifiable information, what we call the PII, to each reporting company because the reporting company has a reporting obligation. So if you're a company applicant or a beneficial owner, you need to provide that information to the reporting company so that the reporting company can turn around and provide that uh, to FinCEN. Uh, so in lieu of doing that, if you just want to provide a number to the reporting company, you provide your PII directly to FinCEN and FinCEN will automatically issue to you a FinCEN identifier. You only can do it once, it's just one number. Uh, you can't apply for multiple ones. Uh, then you turn around, once you have that FinCEN identifier, you give that uh, number to the reporting company in place of your PII. And that sounds like a good solution because you may not want your PII to be out there with a lot of different reporting companies, but like most things, there's a catch to it. Um, the individual will need to update FinCEN of any changes within 30 days, and that's forever. There's no process in place right now to deactivate a FinCEN identifier. And this effectively switches the updating obligation from the reporting company to the individual who has that FinCEN identifier. Let's talk briefly about retaining and disclosing the information that's provided to this federal database. Uh, the information that's provided to this database at, at, at the federal government, it's confidential and it can't be disclosed by any federal official, uh, any state uh, or local tribal agency, uh, or any employee of a bank or regulatory agency receiving that beneficial ownership information. 
And FinCEN can only disclose this BOI only upon a receipt of a request through what they call appropriate protocols from a federal agency engaged in national security, intelligence, or law enforcement. And there's no court authorization required for releasing information to the federal government, to other agencies within the federal government. But court authorization is required if the information is requested uh, by a state, local, or tribal law enforcement agency. So there's a difference there between the federal and state uh, regimes and what uh, triggers a court authorization. Uh, interestingly, foreign governments also have the right to obtain beneficial ownership information under uh, similar submissions and through some uh, protocols that are defined in the regulations that were issued back in December. Well, this is a lot of information. Uh, what resources has FinCEN put out? FinCEN has come under criticism for not publicizing the CTA, what the requirements are, what you need to do to comply with it. And so what it's done is to, to do several outreach efforts. One is they've published a small entity compliance guide that was last updated in, in December of 2023. It's a, it's a good resource, and I would strongly urge you to review that. It has good checklists and good explanations of what's required for submitting information to FinCEN. Uh, equally uh, helpful is the FAQ, and this is organized topically, and it identifies various questions that have come in to FinCEN, and there are responses to that. Uh, it was updated in January, and again, in, uh, most recently in April, uh, less than a month ago, and those, those are very good resources to use, so I would highly recommend both of those, and they can be found on the FinCEN website which is fincen.gov backslash BOI for beneficial ownership information. Uh, there's also some informational brochures and videos on the website. Uh, I personally would not spend too much time on those. I didn't find those very helpful, but the first two are. What about civil and criminal exposure on this? Well, for reporting violations, it's a civil penalty of not more than $500 for each day that the violation continues. And that amount is subject to an inflation adjustment under federal law. For 2024, that $500 fine or penalty is now $591. And there's a criminal fine of not more than $10,000 or two years in jail. Uh, it's important to note that there's a willful failure to comply standard here. So if there's an innocent paperwork violation, that's not going to trigger the penalties under the CTA. But if there's a willful failure, that's a, an intentional knowing uh, disregard of a known legal duty, uh, that will trigger potential civil or criminal exposure on that. Um, the beneficial owner or the company applicant can be liable and face penalties if they willfully fail or cause a reporting company to fail to report complete or updated BOI. Um, I'm not going to go too much in detail on unauthorized disclosure or use violations. It's a more severe penalty regime in that situation. And the policy perspective or rationale behind that was uh, Congress wanted people to provide this information to a federal database on the assurance that it would not be disclosed or released uh, purposely or willfully. And if there is a situation like that, the penalties are more severe than a reporting violation. There is a safe harbor, and this safe harbor provides that if someone knows that a report that's been submitted contains inaccurate information, and you try to correct it, you can do so if you do it uh, not more than 90 days after you uh, submitted the report uh, and to correct that information. So that's uh, uh, sort of a fail safe or safe harbor they, they've built into the statute. Um, there is no good faith effort standard uh, as a safe harbor. You can't submit a report saying, to the best of my knowledge, this information is true, correct, and complete. You're making a categorical, unqualified statement that that information is true, correct, and complete. So you need to be uh, aware of that. And you're considered to have failed to file a report, uh, a complete report, or update the information if you if the person causes the failure. You know that's one thing. There's a willful failure, or the person is a senior officer of the entity at the time of the failure. So there's a potential liability in that situation. Um, Finson has made it very clear that the reporting company is the one responsible for ensuring the accuracy of the information that's reported to FinCEN, uh, even if the reporting company obtains that information from another party, such as from a beneficial owner or from a company applicant. 
And the certification that's being made at the time of filing is that the report, all the information contained in that report on beneficial owners, about the reporting company, about the company ap applicant, that's all true, correct, and complete. And that will come back, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit about service providers uh, submitting this information on behalf of a reporting company and how that is playing out. Well, let's transition into the first uh, 120 days. How, how have things gone so far that, now that we're four months into the rollout of the CTA? First, uh, so far, the beneficial ownership IT system has not crashed. And that may be a good sign, but again, this, the point is uh, FinCEN has been underwhelmed by the number of filings made to date. FinCEN projected 32 million initial reports would be filed in 2024. But through April 30th, 2024, FinCEN's director, Andrea Gacki, uh, made a statement uh, a week and a half ago saying that they had only received 1.3 million filings to date. So the first four months into it, there's only been 1.3 million filings and that's dramatically short of what the projections are. And that basically means that there will need, need to be 3.7 million filings per month on average for the rest of the year, which works out to about 125,000 filings per day, each day for the rest of the year to get to that 32 million number. Uh, will that happen? I don't know, but that seems uh, unlikely in, in my view. But I think what is accounting for some of the shortfall or two things. One is, I think people are waiting until later in the year to file their initial reports because they have until January 1, 2025 or pre-2024 entities to make that filing. Plus, I think some people are relying or waiting to see what happens with the court cases challenging the constitutionality of the CTA. And I'll touch on that in a bit, but uh, I think those may be the reasons for that shortfall. Well, let's talk about that, about the uh, the recent case, there was a case in Alabama Federal District Court, uh, what we call the Yellen decision. Uh, there was a lot of uh, press uh, when the decision was issued on Friday, March 1st, and it said the CTA is ruled unconstitutional. Well, yes, it was, but it only applied to the parties to that case. It did not apply nationally. And I think people, once they realize that and read the judgment in the case and the mandate, uh, their enthusiasm waned dramatically because of that. Um, as I mentioned, the case uh, was issued or handed down on Friday. The following Monday, FinCEN issued a statement saying that the court's judgment made clear that it's limited to the parties in that case. There's no national application for that. The government filed an appeal of that decision to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, there are three other cases that are out there floating around, one in federal court, one is in Ohio, one's in Maine, one's in Michigan, uh, again, all federal cases, and they challenge the constitutionality of the CTA. The one that I'm looking at in particular is the Michigan case. That's a well-pleaded complaint in that case. It raises some in interesting and intriguing Fourth Amendment illegal search and seizure uh, policy issues. Uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, FinCEN also uh, makes it very clear that uh, you still have to comply with the CTA. If you're not a party, weren't a party of that litigation in Alabama, you need to comply with the requirements. There's no suspension, uh, no deferral, uh, no timeout. Uh, so I think that's important for people to realize and uh, to, to think that you can wait uh, to see how the courts will rule on the, cost, on the constitutionality. Keep in mind that in the Alabama case, and that's the one that's advanced the, the farthest so far, the brief that was filed by the appellees in that case was filed on Monday. Uh, the government's reply brief is due, I think, on June 3rd, and oral argument has been scheduled for the week of September 16th. So it's going fast, I think, by appeal standards, but from uh, those waiting to sit, sit around and wait to see what the court does, uh, it's going to be late in the year at the very earliest uh, when a decision comes down. And it may go back to the lower court for further proceedings. So it may not be that dispositive at that point. Um, one point I do want to make, and this is something that uh, I think a lot of people don't appreciate, the, few, the U.S. is facing tremendous pressure internationally uh, to comply with international standards on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. Uh, the U.S. basically is an outlier. 
uh, when you talk to Treasury, talk to Congress, uh, we just are in terms of complying with these standards. And the U.S. Uh, faces an evaluation by an international group uh, based in Paris, the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, and the fiscal inspection is in early 2026. And it's critically important that Treasury to Treasury that the CTA remain in effect and that the U.S. Uh, get a good report card uh, on its beneficial ownership legislation uh, efforts. Uh, to date, the U.S. has received an F rating, a non-compliant rating NC, which is basically an F, and the U.S. Uh, wants to get beyond that. So we'll see. Um, another area that uh, has created some challenges for lawyers and others, uh, for clients, deals with the various uh, exemptions to the definition of a, a reporting company under the CTA. And there are three that uh, come to mind and ones that I think a lot of people are trying to see whether they can fit within the requirements or criteria for those exemptions. One is a large operating company exemption. And basically you have to report at least $5 million of gross receipts on tax forms for the previous year, employ more than 20 uh, full-time employees in the US and have a physical presence in the US. If you tick all three boxes, you may be eligible for that large operating company exemption and if you do that, you don't have to file a report with FinCEN. Uh, you can aggregate revenues um, and, and sales uh, for this large operating company exemption. You can't do that for employees, though. It has to be employees of that entity. You can't aggregate them from different uh, affiliated uh, entities. The aggregation rule for the gross receipts, though, curiously only applies to corporations. The regulation uses the word corporations. You thought it would have been the word entities would have been used there, but it says corporations. And I think that may have the potential for tripping up some companies who are trying to aggregate revenues to satisfy this uh, exemption. But we'll see how that plays out. Um, the other one I think that uh, a lot of people are trying to use is the subsidiary exemption. And that's limited to subsidiaries, not parents or other affiliates of exempt entities. So let's say you're a large operating company, you qualify for that exemption, and if you have a, a subsidiary of that large operating company that's 100% owned and controlled by that large operating company, that subsidiary is exempt. Um, so that's an important uh, exemption I think a lot of people are trying to take advantage of. But keep in mind that the ownership interest must be fully 100% owned or controlled by the exempt entity. Uh, so you need to look at the ownership structure and the uh, family tree to make sure that that complies with that. And the last one is the tax exempt entity exemption, a 501c exemption. And the question on that one is, if, let's focus on a 501c3 entity. And you create the entity today, you apply for the IRS determination, for it to issue the IRS determination letter. That may be forthcoming weeks or months thereafter. Well, when does the exemption apply? Is it when the entity is created? Or do you have to wait until the IRS issues that exemption letter months later. And there's a debate among uh, some lawyers about uh, which way to go. Benson has not answered that question, unfortunately. Uh, so we're trying to request guidance from Benson on how to deal with that situation. What I was also recommend, uh, what I have found during the first 120 days, and clients have been working on this, you need to be proactive in, in determining whether an exemption applies. You need uh, if you're not a mom and pa, but you have, you're an organization, a lot of subsidiaries, a lot of affiliates, a large family tree, you need to determine and go through there methodically to determine whether an exemption applies. Uh, and it's better to do that sooner rather than later. And if you, if, if you determine that, that an exemption doesn't apply, you need to gather the information that will be submitted to FinCEN. Um, you may have some uh, beneficial owners who may be reluctant to provide information. You need to work on them. You need to identify the company applicants uh, for uh, entities created after January 1, 2024. So there's some legwork to do there and you need to start that sooner rather than later, even though you may not actually file a report until later this year uh, or later in, this, in the calendar year, you should uh, work on that information. One thing that we've also discovered too is the CTA is complex. Uh, the regulations are complex. Um, and they created this very detailed reporting regime. With that said, they could still not envision or could not envision every possible permutation 
that in practice we've run into. Uh, fact patterns differ that FinCEN did not anticipate, and uh, there's no guidance on that. So we're left, uh, practitioners and others are left out there wondering, well, how do you do that? And just give you an example. Let's say there's an entity that lapsed out of good standing. Uh, it was created uh, some years ago. Then you need to reinstate it in 2024 for whatever reason. When you reinstate it and the entity lapsed, does it constitute a new entity you're creating in 2024? Or does it relate back to when it was originally formed back years ago? And that has importance if you're a company applicant, because if you file a, doc, a reinstatement document today, if you're a company applicant, does that create a situation where you're there is a company applicant because it's created after January 1, 2024? Or there may not be one because it goes back uh, pre-2024. So it's that type of detailed issue that FinCEN never envisioned or anticipated in the regulations that we're seeking guidance from FinCEN on that. Um, some lawyers uh, don't want to hit the send button. Uh, when you go onto the database at FinCEN, there is a, you fill out the beneficial ownership information report, uh, you populate it with all the information, then there's a send button that says you're certifying that it's true, correct, and complete. Uh, some lawyers don't want to hit that button. They say, we can't certify that that information is true, correct, and complete. The reporting company is providing that information. And some law firms prohibit their lawyer from making that type of certification. Um, and that's where third-party vendors come into the picture. Uh, if the reporting company doesn't do it, won't do it, can't do it, not in a position to do it, third-party vendors have stepped into the void to provide that service. Um, some third-party vendors aggregate the data for the reporting company to send. They'll populate it in a database so that the reporting company can hit the send button. And others will populate the report, then they'll send that completed BOI report to FinCEN, and they'll hit the send button. Um, so you need to find out when you're engaging a third-party vendor what service they're providing and how comprehensive it is, and will they actually uh, submit that information to FinCEN, or will they require that the reporting company send it once uh, the, the third-party vendor populates the form? So try to understand what that's all about. Um, if you're a lawyer and you outsource uh, these BOI reports to third parties, uh, should lawyers be recommending the vendors uh, that's prepare and submit those reports? Uh, has the lawyer done any due diligence on the vendor? How is their data security? Uh, some PII will be provided to that vendor. Is it secure? I think a law firm doesn't want to be in a position of recommending a third-party vendor without checking into a state of privacy uh, uh, policies and protections. Then there's a hack that occurs sometime later, and the client will say, why did you recommend that, that company to me? Because it had poor data security. So you just need to be careful, do some due diligence, and if you recommend uh, a company, just make sure there has been some uh, investigation into the privacy and security controls of that third-party vendor. Use of FinCEN identifiers. What have we learned during the first 120 days? Um, it takes the onus off the reporting company to provide the PII to FinCEN. That's probably good. As I mentioned earlier, there's no process to deactivate it. FinCEN gets that. They understand there's no process to deactivate. They're working, they say, on a process uh, where you can deactivate it. Um, if you get a FinCEN identifier, uh, you need to update FinCEN directly with that updated information. And again, it's going to be a 30-day turnaround on that. So if you get divorced, there's a name change, you move to a different home, you need to update FinCEN within 30 days. And a lot of those things can happen within a quick time period. Uh, you get divorced, you go through a name change, you move, uh, you go to a different state. Uh, all that requires uh, notification to FinCEN. Um, but if, you, if you're a company applicant and you provide your PII, uh, you don't have to update that information with FinCEN. That, that's the difference. Um, so be careful when getting a FinCEN identifier. I have one. Thousands of others have applied for one and, and received one. You just have to keep in mind that you need to update that information when it occurs. Um, what about including CTA compliance provisions in real estate documents? Uh, keep in mind that if you don't comply with the CTA, that doesn't mean that the document that uh, that they created or, or registered the reporting company is somehow revoked or suspended. 
that doesn't happen. So if you don't comply with the CTA, it's just criminal and civil liability uh, for the individuals, but it doesn't result in the revocation of the reporting company's creation of registration documents. I don't think there's a compelling rationale to include compliance covenants and purchase and sale agreements, leases and development agreements, among others. But I do think there's a distinction with loan documents that may warrant different treatment. Uh, the CTA is part of the anti-money laundering landscape in the U.S. And I think banks will feel a need to include CTA compliance provisions because it's part of the AML compliance regime. And I think there's going to be some linkage between the CTA and, as I mentioned earlier, the customer due diligence uh, regulations that will be forthcoming later this year, uh, early next year, later this year, earlier next year, and we'll have to see how that uh, those concepts are linked together. But don't be surprised if you see CTA compliance provisions and loan documents. I think there is a basis for including them, but obviously you need to review the scope and breadth of those provisions. Um, the penalties uh, surprise people. I think they're larger than people first thought. The civil penalties for noncompliance adjust for inflation. It's up close to $600 now. The $10,000 limit is for criminal fines, not civil penalties. And again, the, it's a willful failure standard. So it's a voluntary, intentional violation of a known legal duty. If you refuse to provide the BOI to a reporting company, that's probably you're acting willfully in doing so. And you may expose yourself to criminal liability in that situation, civil liability. Um, and one technique that I think some people are using uh, to make sure that you get this information from your beneficial owners for newly created entities where you have an LLC operating agreement, just have a space by the signature line that requires that the beneficial owner include the FinCEN identifier for that individual day one up front, so you don't have to contact that person again for that information. So that may be a sort of a good technique. And if you're a senior officer, how much do you have to browbeat the beneficial owners and company applicants to get the information? Uh, how much is enough uh, without triggering that willful violation standard? Uh, that remains to be seen. Lawyers of, as company applicants, uh, FinCEN issued good guidance back in January in its FAQ as to when lawyers would be considered to act as company applicants when they're involved in creating or registering a reporting company. And the test is, is the lawyer primarily responsible for directing or controlling the creation or registration document? It doesn't matter who signs the document. It's functionally who controlled or directed the creation of that document, what it contained, where it's going to be filed, uh, when the filing will occur. That dictates uh, whether you're going to be a company applicant in that situation. Something that FinCEN did not consider in the regulations is you have this dynamic between local counsel and lead counsel, not unusual for a, a company's primary counsel to engage local counsel in a different jurisdiction to provide an opinion, to create entities or whatever. And what happens in that situation if the lead counsel instructs local counsel to prepare and file a certificate of formation, for example, to file an L, create an LLC, who's the company, second company applicant in that situation? Is it the lead counsel or is it local counsel? Uh, so that needs to be worked out between the parties, um, and uh, that should be easily done. We've done that before in our firm uh, to reach that arrangement with uh, when we're serving as local counsel. Is it time for administrative oversight? If you have a somewhat complex organizational structure, who's keeping track of these changes in beneficial owners? Not only the identity of the beneficial owners, for example, senior officers may change. That needs to be reported to FinCEN. Addresses of beneficial owners needs to be uh, notified to FinCEN. Who's keeping track of that within the organization? Is someone responsible for doing that? Uh, so that's, I think, one good takeaway, that someone needs to be monitoring this information on an enterprise level to make sure that there's compliance with the CTA reporting obligations because it's a quick 30-day period to notify FinCEN. Um, and there's some questions whether lawyers have an obligation to remind the, remind the reporting company that it must update the report initially filed. It depends on the law firm, lawyer, the relationship. Uh, so don't be surprised if you see some of that uh, reminder activity going on. Uh, governance document changes. Um, I think LLC operating agreements should specifically obligate members to comply with the reporting obligations under federal law. I mentioned, mentioned the CTA in particular. 
And you should think about what remedies are available if someone willfully fails to comply with those contractual obligations. Do you susp uh, suspend distributions, uh, voting rights, whatever? What, what hook do you have to uh, compel compliance? So that's something you may want to think about in that situation. Legal opinions, uh, I haven't seen too many of those uh, today. I think it's still early on in the process whether lawyers will be issuing it, legal opinions as to who constitutes a beneficial owner, does an exemption apply. I think you'll see reasoned uh, uh, memoranda on that or uh, advice, but I haven't seen any formal opinions at this uh, juncture. Uh, we're still pretty early into the process. There's an exception to the definition of beneficial owner for creditors, and that may be an important exception to the definition of uh, beneficial owner, but FinCEN has not addressed the scope of that in the regulations. Um, the regulations themselves contain some commentary on that, but when you get to the small entity compliance guide, it really doesn't address that at all. So we'll have to see whether that scope will be uh, available to people. When do you know when an entity has been created? Uh, this is sort of a pandemic driven provision and uh, FinCEN issued guidance on this. They said, look, you'll know when an entity is created or registered. It's going to be the earlier of two dates. One is when you get actual notice that's been created or registered, or when the Secretary of State provides public notice, such as through some registry that's available on a database. That's the key date for determining when the clock begins to, on, begins to run on some of these matters. Uh, just touch on engagement letters. Some uh, law firms are including CTA provisions and engagement letters. I think you'll find that all across the board at this point. Uh, there may not be a need to include one because why call out the CTA specifically? You don't do it for other federal laws. Why, why just the CTA? So there's been back and forth on that. There are some many, uh, some state level CTAs that we need to worry about. One that's enact, enacted already is the, in New York, an LLC Transparency Act. That initially proposed a public database of all this information, but that was removed by the governor. Uh, so we don't have to, worry about that uh, prospect. Uh, three states have considered or have considered transparency type legislation that has not gone anywhere yet. But in light of those cases that we've talked about challenging the constitutionality of the CTA, will other states start taking this, uh, this action? We'll see. In terms of trust, who's the 25% or plus owner? Uh, trust assets are attributed to various parties to trust agreements, ranging from trustees, beneficiaries, and grantors. Uh, so it runs a gambit on that. Uh, FinCEN's in the process of issuing more guidance on trusts and trustees. Uh, to date, it has not been uh, that widespread, but we, we, we're really seeking to get more guidance from FinCEN on that. And so with uh, four minutes left, Jeff, I think that's a sprint through the CTA. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Uh, clearly, industry expert, you know, a content expert, thought leader in this space. So we, like Kevin mentioned, we do have a, a few minutes and maybe we go over a little bit because we've got some questions. Kevin, I don't know whether you want to, you want me to read some of the Q&A that's uh, been posted here at the bottom, or do you want to read it and kind of answer accordingly? Do you have access to that? Or I'm happy to go through each of these yeah, questions. Let me, yeah, yeah, happy to go through a few of those questions. First question and is- then, And then, by the way, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, I may have, uh, I, I have a few kind of fact pattern questions that I want to go over that we might be helpful for the audience to go through uh, as well after we go through these, if we have some time. Okay, let me just uh, take a couple of these questions here. Uh, weren't the reporting requirements suspended earlier this year uh, only for those uh, individuals or entities that were parties to that Alabama litigation? And they had to be a party as of uh, March 1, 2024. Uh, so I think that's of limited uh, utility to most people. Uh, can information from FinCEN be released by a FOIA request? I think the answer on that is no. Uh, that's my understanding at least. Um, does a person submitting the information need to sign his or her name uh, if submitting on behalf of the beneficial owner? I think there is a place on there for uh, an electronic signature on that on the BOI report, uh, report form that's submitted. Um, let's go on to the next one. Let's see here. What are the mechanics of registering when you have 50 entities or each as 10 or more immediate beneficiaries? Uh, you can't file 
a report for the parent entity and say, oh, this is the parent entity. We have 15 subs and this covers all the subs. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You have to file a report for each reporting company, which is going to be a pain point for some entities if they can't take advantage of an exemption. So I think that's the uh, the, the answer to that one. Um, okay. Jeff, you want to go over a couple of questions that some people had on the uh, yeah. one here? Yeah, thank, thank you, Kevin. Go ahead. Yeah, there's one is, is there a checklist that real estate owners can reference related to the, the reporting requirements? What I would suggest on that is you go to the uh, FinCEN website, FinCEN.gov backslash BOI, and there's a small entity compliance guide. It's about 50, 60 pages long, but it's a great resource for check. It is truly a checklist. And it shows you how you qualify for an exemption. Are you a reporting company or not? Are there, do you qualify for an exception to the def definition of beneficial owner? Uh, so it's a good resource and it has examples too. When you have multi-tier entities, how you calculate the ownership interest, because that can get very complicated very quickly. And that's a, uh, 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 that, that's just something to do. Um, there's a question, what is the cost of hiring someone to do all this for you? It depends on uh, these vendors that are out there. Usually uh, they do on a per reporting company basis and the number of beneficial owners that are involved with a reporting company. And it can range from a couple hundred dollars to more. It just depends on what services and the scope of uh, engagement that you're working with with that third party vendor. I must say it's sort of all over the place right now. Um, so you just have to shop around uh, for those vendors. Another question is, what are the general costs of compliance? Well, there's no cost to submit a BOI report. When you go on the uh, FinCEN website, that's free of charge. There's no cost for doing that. But if you engage a third party to do that on your behalf, or you engage professionals to assist you in determining what how you go about populating the report, that's going to be a cost. FinCEN estimated the initial cost would be $85 per reporting company. That's been blown out of the water. I think in a lot of cases, it's it's dramatically more than that. Um, so that's, I think, the response on that one. Um, why are CPAs and some attorneys opting out of assisting clients? And I think it, it's, again, it's just a, a liability mm -hmm. issue. The certification that's being made that is true, correct, and complete. And some attorneys, some accountants don't want to make that certification on behalf of a client. Um, so Jeff, I know we're going over, but that's that's just a couple of yeah, questions. We've got, we've, we've got one more. We've got one more question here uh, from uh, anonymous. So, if a foreign company buys agricultural land in California or the Midwest, do they have to report to FinCEN who the real owners are? Well, again, if the foreign company is registered to do business in the U.S. And let's assume that it is registered in the U.S., they need to comply with the reporting requirements under the uh, CTA, and they have to identify who the beneficial owners are, either exercise substantial control or who have the ownership interest in that reporting company. They have to report that information to FinCEN. And another question here, what do you do if a beneficiary won't give you the information? Um, I think this is a sort of a two-part thing on this one. One is you need to educate them that there's a compliance obligation under federal law. This is not something the reporting company woke up one morning and dreamed of and said, I'd like to have this information. This is a federally mandated requirement and a willful failure, such as this beneficiary who refuses to give the information, that may be a willful failure. That person is subjecting himself or herself to criminal and civil exposure with the federal government, with law enforcement. And that should be compelling enough to provide the information. Uh, so there's, you just can't thumb your nose at fence and say, I'm not going to provide it. There are consequences. Yeah, those are, those are all great points. And I think mm -hmm. we're, we're about at the end here. Um, and I know, you know, there's uh, there's probably a lot more threads to pull here. And I know there's some, still some uncertainty around this. Um, but you know, we will be, like I told the audience, we will be following up with this presentation, um, you know, particularly with real for real estate, real estate owners, fiduciaries, you know, uh, this will become an even bigger topic as the year goes on, as we get closer to this, uh, this deadline. 
And um, you know, certainly, hopefully, this link helps and the presentation helps people kind of gain some understanding of, of what we have here and the why uh, on on you know, why people have to do it. Hopefully, we didn't scare people as it relates to the regulations and the penalties because they they seem to be pretty. There seem to be a lot of teeth to this, uh, Kevin. You know, as opposed to maybe some other regulations out there. So. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if you have any final words, Kevin, as it relates to this, as it relates to real estate reporting and, and otherwise, but uh, why, don't, why don't I give you the final word on this? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And, and again, thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation to your group. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Peter, for that. Uh, I would say that uh, you need to comply with the CTA. Uh, I don't think it, you should rely on the, a court declaring the CTA un unconstitutional, applying that nationally. I think at some point, this is probably going to wind up in the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, but until then, I think uh, you need to comply with it. Uh, you may not like it, but its uh, I think you have to deal with it, and uh, you'll do it and uh, rely on your professionals uh, to assist you in that effort. Excellent. Excellent. Well, like I said, there, there may be a follow-up uh, on this as things evolve, but, uh, but again, want to thank you, uh, Kevin Shepard, for you. providing your insight and your expertise. Thank you to my uh, my partner in crime, Peter Lawson, okay. and uh, I hope that everyone gained a lot of insight here. I would encourage everyone to get involved in our fiduciary committee and the CCIM Los Angeles chapter, and uh, again, uh, revisit these slides if you have any questions. So uh, thank you again, and with that, we will exit the presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Kevin. Excellent uh, presentation. Thank you.